And and the other thing I thought was really interesting is the is their depiction of their quantum computer, which um, you, you know looks suspiciously like I think it's a, a, a Google quantum computer, and. Um, uh, uh, I, I thought that was interesting. You know, it, it wasn't really that far away from a, 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 an actual device. Um, I, I don't know if that shows how impressive looking quantum computers are, but uh, I, I thought that was a really interesting aspect of the program that I think physicists will appreciate. I, I certainly appreciated that. I've been, I've not seen Google's device other than in photos, but I've seen in the flesh, as it were, IBM's device in Zurich. And that looks very similar, um, both to Google's and to the, the one that was used in the program. And I was quite excited to see that. You know, it, it, it kind of told me straight away, well, they've done, <laughs> they've done some research here and they're keen to make this look like the real thing. And, you know, you could imagine a quantum computer being some, you know, in, in, in sort of uh, Hollywood terms being something ridiculous looking, but this one did actually look quite authentic. What you find out about the capabilities of that quantum computer really aren't that authentic, but uh, but but in terms of the way it looked, indeed, it, it looked fantastic. And, you know, that was a contrast to, I've always loved the way that the, um, the D-Wave computer that uh, that I guess you've seen Hamish looks very different or at least the in, in terms of its external look you know it's this kind of black box which in a way you know it also also seemed very apt it, it felt like oh yes that's that's how a quantum computer should look when you first saw that but actually what you know seeing the all of these wires and it's all kind of the cryogenics that you're you're really seeing in the uh, in the in these quantum computers you know, that all looked very authentic. And it sort of started to me, it started the the program off on the right kind of foot. I was willing to go along with it because they got some of that right. I, I thought what this the show got right more than anything else was was all that sort of Silicon Valley setting, you know, the, the culture, the, the, the way that people were having conversations about their work over lunch, the the sort of the, the mix of architectures that that sort of style of campus even felt very Silicon Valley and I think there's an argument that for all the ridiculous sides of the plot uh, just uh, an extreme version of some of the the negative sides of Silicon Valley you know the idea that the devs team in particular are super isolated they're encouraged to work horribly unhealthy hours and their whole reason for for being is to achieve an outcome that's already been predetermined by any means necessary and that leads to some you know, real sort of mental health problems for some of them and I, I thought that was a really interesting side of the show alongside as as, as you've mentioned some scientific things that maybe aren't so believable. <laughs> and, and another uh, thing is that um, the, uh, you know, the, the relationship between um, uh, Silicon Valley and San Francisco was portrayed as well, because you see um, the employees, uh, you know, of this, uh, of this high tech company being coached in um, every morning. And, um, you know, you see that, uh, the, the, you know, they're living a, a, a a comfortable life in San Francisco, but, um, you know, right next to um, homeless people, you know, highlighting the fact that, you know, although it's an extremely rich city, uh, San Francisco does have a, 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 a really a serious homeless problem. Uh, you know, I thought li li little details like that um, sort of made me think that, yes, I'm, I'm sort of getting a picture of what it is like to, um, you know, live in San Francisco and then commute to Silicon Valley uh, to work for one of these companies. And, and Hamish, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, I'm not going to give anything away by saying you'll find that it's more than a detail, that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes very interesting. Um, but absolutely, the way Lily and her boyfriend step over the homeless guy in their doorway, you know, in a very congenial way between both between all of them as they go out to work. Yeah, that indeed really seemed to capture what uh, what is happening in San Francisco. Well, yeah, I mean, I, let's um, without without really giving away any massive spoilers, um, there's two particular um, sort of interpretations of quantum mechanics that feature throughout the show in two very um, sort of 
uh, mirror reflections of each other in some ways. Uh, and that's unsurprisingly, I'm sure to you, Phil, especially the many worlds interpretation. But then rather surprisingly, um, the De Broglie Bohm pilot wave theory. Now, of all the possible, you know, apart from many worlds, of all the other sort of theories that they could have picked, that was most interesting to me that they went with that one. Now, of course, it did have a link to um, the fact that that theory in particular um, allows you to take um, a route that the universe is sort of deterministic, and that's quite central to the plot for other reasons that we won't mention. Um, but what did you think about that, Phil? And and could you could you probably you know, our, our readers, um, sorry, listeners, our listeners might be familiar with many worlds we've seen it depicted in um, every kind of uh, popular media for many years. But, you know, the pilot wave theory, that's that's a strange one. Could you could you tell our listeners about it a little bit? Well, it, 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 I guess it is less familiar, but in some ways I was not terribly surprised that they alighted on that one too, because to put it bluntly, that's, uh, the, the many, many worlds and the de Broglie Bohm interpretations feel to me like the trendy interpretations of the moment. And I don't necessarily mean that in a derogatory sense, but, um, you know, uh, de Broglie Bohm seems to have a lot of, uh, uh, love at the moment from certainly from people who popularize, um, quantum mechanics. And and it, it is an interesting one because it um, it basically showed, and this it was really uh, David Bohm uh, who who, uh, who who did the instrumental work in showing this that it's possible to formulate quantum mechanics as we know it as a theory in which particles uh, sort of return. They don't you know, remain as sort of spread out things, that you actually have real things, real particles as such that are you know, going about their business, but they're going about their business kind of guided by these so-called pilot waves, which are expressed as a, uh, a slightly mysterious force or quantum potential is how it's often expressed, as sort of wavy potential that guides the, 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 the uh, particles to do so things. So you recover the idea that underneath what looks like the sort of indeterminacy and fuzziness of quantum mechanics, there's something actually quite precise and concrete. There are these particles and the strange properties that they seem to have, like this ability to interfere with each other or to interfere with themselves even, that comes from these pilot waves, the these waves um, in the quantum potential that are sort of guiding their behavior. And so it's really a re- Recasting of quantum mechanics that returns you to the for what a lot of physicists is the much more reassuring physical picture that there is real stuff, there are real things out there, um, and that you, we're, we're sort of saved, if you like, from the alternative in the Co- Copenhagen interpretation that actually we can't really say, you know, what it is that is causing this behavior. We can only speak about what we observe. Um, and I feel like that's the essence of the Copenhagen interpretation, which I feel got a bit of a bad uh, press from from devs, it was dismissed in a, in, a, in a lecture as, oh, well, that just says that you, when you make a measurement, you affect the, um, the system you're looking at, which, you know, happens actually in other interpretations and, of course, happens in classical physics as well. So it's not quite the quantum interpre- the Copenhagen interpretation, but that's the idea. So um, a, 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 as you say, that allows us then to return to a kind of deterministic idea of quantum mechanics where there are particular things happening. There's something if you like, always happening all the time, even if we can't find out exactly what it is, it's actually there. That's what the de de Broglie Bohm is telling you. And in some ways, what it amounts to is a version of the many worlds interpretation without the many worlds. There's just one world. And, you know, what's sometimes said about de Broglie Bohm, and I quite like this way of putting it, is that the waves are actually uh, telling you that there are all these other worlds, except that they're not populated by particles. There's nothing there. They're just virtual worlds. So you don't get into the complications that the many worlds has of these alternative parallel realities, which, as you say, is in the end what the show, what Debs relies on for its plot. Mm. 